Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some of which I grew up with and some of which are new to me. Today is one of the latter. This is Uncle Henry's Nuclear Waste Dump. Uh, this was a type-in listing from Antic Volume 5 Number 8, or December 1986 to normal people. Um, this was written in BASIC, um, so it was just something that you could boot up your computer, you type it in, save it on a disc or cassette, and you had a free game. Marvellous. Uh, so this was developed by a guy called James Haig, uh, and it's a puzzle game about stacking shapes. This was actually quite a relatively rare formula at the time. Um, the original Tetris came out in, in 1984 and was subsequently ported to various platforms over the time. Um, but uh, yeah, the puzzle game formula wasn't really very well established, um, certainly on 8-bit computers at the time. So the consoles were experimenting with it a bit more, but on home computers, it was a relatively novel concept. And in fact, writing on Atari Mania in 2015, uh, Haig actually provided a few thoughts on the game himself. So he said that he wrote this game in five days in the summer of 1986 without having seen or heard of Tetris, and he was trying to be original. Um, and he also describes it as that's probably the most interesting thing about it in retrospect. I don't entirely agree, I rather like this game, so let's go take a look. Okay, here we are with Uncle Henry's Nuclear Waste Dump, over 50 billion served. Another game from the demented mind of James Haig. Copyright 1986, Antic Publishing. So this um, is a typing game from Antic Magazine. So uh, you would type in the basic listing for this and then you would have a game to play. So you'd save that on uh, disc or cassette um, and yeah, you could play that whenever you want. Free software, lovely. All you have to do is put in a bit of effort. So I guess it's not entirely free. You just pay with effort rather than money. Aside from the money you spent for the magazine in the first place. So it's not free at all. Um, I'll shut up. Let's play this game. I hope you've got insurance, says Uncle Henry. So this is a puzzle game. And the puzzling aspect in this is that when you drop something, it cannot touch something that is the same shape. And so, what you have to do is drop stuff accordingly to make sure that shapes are not touching horizontally or vertically. They can touch diagonally because they're not really touching when you do that. Uh, but yeah, for example, I couldn't drop that there because it will land on that and blow up. So, the ultimate aim in this is to build up to the top of the pit. So you don't have to fill rows or anything like that. Uh, but you are trying to reach the top of the screen. So if I drop this here... Okay, that's something you need to bear in mind. So if you drop something on an edge like that, it will roll down the slope. Um, so that's the main wrinkle in this. So probably the easiest way to reach the top of the screen is to fill every line. Uh, but obviously that will take forever. And so you're going to need to make some slopes if you want to clear this more quickly. But in building those slopes, you need to bear in mind the fact that they will fall off like that and probably blow up. And they fall off in both directions. So bear that in mind. Okay, let's try again. Paying attention this time, now that I understand the mechanics a bit more. Okay, the um, speed setting that you have on the title screen, that affects that speed meter up in the corner. So what happens is you hold that up there and that timer will count down according to whatever the speed setting is. And so that basically gives you a few seconds of leeway before you have to drop the shape. Okay, so we've got a nice bit resting up against the wall there. So we can start building up now, I think. Right, so we don't want to drop that there because it will roll down and explode. Uh, we can put that there. Put that one there. 
You don't need me to say this for every tile, so I'll stop saying that now. Uh, right. Okay, yeah, I'm getting a feel for this now. So we don't want to drop that there because it will roll down and it will land. Oh no! That's what the speed meter is for. Stop you thinking too much. <laughs> uh, you can slow it down, but the, the default speed is on three. Um, the fastest speed just gives you like basically a split second uh, to put each one down. So it's really fast. Um, I don't even know if it's possible, but... Uh, I don't really know how people play Tetris at full speed, so... Maybe I'm not the best judge. So, as I said in the introduction, the creator of this, James Haig, didn't seem to think much of his creation, uh, which is a bit sad, really, but um, I rather like this. Aside from that obnoxious sound effect, and it is an, ob it is an obnoxious sound effect. Um, yeah, aside from that, this is a nice idea for a puzzle game. It's something a bit different. It's not about matching things. In fact, it's specifically about not matching things, which I find quite interesting. It's about creating patterns. Right, if I pop that there, that should roll down to the side and that should be safe. Wonderful. Okay. Can't put that there. Yeah, so as you play, you're kind of building up quite an aesthetically pleasing pattern, really. Almost like a checkerboard, but it's made out of three shapes and colours instead of just two. Alright, again, we can let that roll down the side. Boom, 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 boom. Don't think you get any more points for doing that, so you, you don't really need to do that. I just quite like the way it rolls down. <laughs> uh, yeah, you. Uh, you got that. Yeah, see, the time limit is starting to become a slight issue now as I'm having to think about my moves a bit more. All right, we need to build out a bit more again. All right, that can't go there. That also can't go there. You can go over there, out the way. You can go there. Yeah, so the, the, the one slight blessing here is that it, it doesn't accelerate as you play. At least it doesn't accelerate as you play. So you're always playing at the same speed. But the decisions you have to make do get more complex as you progress through the game. to think a little bit more carefully about what you're putting where. Oh no! No! Oh, it was all going so well! Damn it. Right, one more try. Because I, I, I rather like this game. It's very simple, obviously, uh, being a type in listing and written in basic, but... Uh, yeah. If I didn't tell you this was written in basic... I bet you wouldn't know. Largely because the puzzle games are a kind of game that don't need to be super fast action or anything like that. I mean, obviously, the more frantic puzzlers really benefit from having a bit of extra speed there. But the, games like this, where yeah, you take your time over deciding your moves... Yeah, basic's absolutely fine for that. And this isn't doing anything complex graphically either, so it's just using graphics mode 1. Um, I think exclusively, I don't think it's even using any display list interrupts here to display multiple graphics modes on screen at once. All it's doing, 
all of those blocks down at the bottom are just redefined text characters. And that was a really common way of doing things in basic games. So rather than rather than working with the Atari's hardware sprite system or player missiles as they were called, um, yeah, you ju you just redefine some text characters instead, and that would allow you to have custom graphics in a game um, without having to get into a more complex side of programming because. I don't know, I, I could certainly never get my head around playing missile graphics, but I, I could get my head around redefining character sets without too much difficulty, so um, make of that what you will, bearing in mind how young I was at the time I would have been doing basic programming. But yeah, I, I did do my fair share of basic programming back in the day, it was something I enjoyed doing, something I enjoyed experimenting with. I didn't do anything especially complicated. Um, but I did put together some stuff that were technically games. <laughs> they were technically interactive. So I remember making uh, an adventure game of sorts. So it didn't have a text pass or anything. It was a multiple choice adventure game. Uh, maybe jump. Um, yeah, it was a multiple choice uh, adventure game. Um, inspired by a file I found on one of my brother's discs. So my brother had his own collection of floppy disks for the Atari 8-bit. Uh, they were labelled J and number, rather than just the, the standard uh, numbers that we had for the ones that my dad had put together uh, or acquired from the local computer club. Um, and yeah, there was there was one disk that I, I think... Um, I think it said like John's development disc or something like that, and I was curious what was on there, and I found some basic files. And one of those was a uh, a basic program called Treasures of Krylos, um, which I think was something my brother wrote. I think that was by him. Um, feel free to correct me in the comments if you've ever heard of Treasure. Oh no! Oh, we're safe. Thank God for that. Um, yeah, feel free to correct me in the comments if you've ever heard... Oh, no! Oh! Well, I've got to finish my story now, haven't I? Um, so we'll play once more. Yeah, so Treasures of Krylos, as I say, I believe it was something my brother put together uh, in basic. Um, and what I did is... I played it. I liked it. Um, and then... Because it was written in BASIC, I could look at the program listing and I could see how he did things. And making a multiple choice adventure game, choose your own adventure style, in BASIC is very easy. Because you can just do it entirely with uh, go to and go subs and that sort of thing. So just set up different parts of your program to be the different rooms and the different events that go on in the story. Um, and then take input from the player and then jump to the particular part of the program that resolves whatever they supposedly just did. Yeah, and so I was very inspired by that uh, and I had a good attempt at making my own. I think I, I made some sort of sci-fi adventure. It's probably still lurking on one of the floppy disks that I've got upstairs, uh, but unfortunately my disks were all based on Spartados X rather than the standard Atari DOS system. And for Sparta DOS X to work, you needed the Sparta DOS X cartridge. And although, mm, excuse me, although we've tracked down most of our Atari 8-bit stuff from over the years, one thing that there seems to be no sign of is the Sparta DOS X cartridge. And so that means I've got a lot of discs of my old stuff uh, that I currently can't get to. So, th there are ways of still getting out Spartados X without um, having an original cartridge now. And in fact, from what I can make out, there's quite a, there's been some quite active development on it by um, kind of the broader Atari community. And so that's something I may well have to investigate at some point um, just to see 
if I can get at the stuff that's on those old discs. Because I'm, I'm sure it'd be fascinating to revisit some of those old programs I used to put together. Atari Basic was the last language that I actually felt comfortable with. I mean, outside, outside of stuff like HTML and stuff like that, but that doesn't really count as a programming language. It's a markup language. Um, but yeah, beyond Atari Basic and a bit of STOS on the Atari ST, which was built... Yeah, well, it was basic. It was a form of basic. Um, yeah, I've never really been able to get on with modern programming languages. Um, but Atari Basic, I got pretty confident and comfortable with as the years went on. Oh, dear. Um, you go there. Yeah, and I, I used to really enjoy fiddling around with basic programming, creating effects, creating graphics. We had a great um, character redefinition utility that would allow you to uh, create the, the, the text characters that I was describing that this would have been built out of. And so I always found it incredibly satisfying to create some custom graphics using that and... Um, have them display on screen. Oh, I might have got myself into a mess here. It's all over! Ah, oh, that was going pretty well up until that point. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough about things that are nothing to do with this game, so I think we'll hold that there. Uh, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects moegamer.net where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today and videopackgames.wordpress.com which aims to catalogue the small but well formed library of the Philips G7000 video pack computer also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Thank you.